Good morning. Uh, don't ask. <laughs> Just say, <clears throat> uh, treat, serves me right for trying to save cats from burning buildings. <laughs> um, no, I've never in the, my lifetime had gout. And all of a sudden it flared up yesterday for the first time. I was like, what in the world is this? I went to the doctor late last night. The doctor says, well, you just need to stop eating so much red meat. I thought I had red meat on Monday. We hardly ever eat red meat. So what? Anyway, so if somebody knows what's causing this other than, I don't know, Satan, God punishing me for my sin or something. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're in this place. We thank you that this is your church, that you've allowed us to be a part of of your endeavor here in this world. And Lord, we want to be faithful to you. We want to honor you as you deserve. I pray that you'd speak, that we'd hear you say through Christ, and you would be honored through Christ, I pray. Amen. The uh, headline in the Washington Post caught my attention uh, September 15th, just a few weeks ago. It said, why people are leaving churches. Preachers read articles with titles like that. The article quoted extensively from a book called The Great Dechurching of America, which has been written recently. Authors Jim Davis and Michael Graham were quoted as saying things like this. More people have left the church in the last 25 years than all the new people who became Christians from the first Great Awakening, the second Great Awakening, and all the Billy Graham crusades combined. That's kind of sobering. According to their research, 15% of Americans today identify as de-churched. In other words, people who once attended church regularly, but now maybe once a year or less. 20 years ago, the median church attendance was in the United States 137 people. Today, it's 60, less than half what it once was. The research went on to indicate that most people don't leave churches for dramatic reasons. They were leave for mundane reasons, not because we don't like what the church preaches or we had some terrible experience. It's because, well, we moved and just haven't found another church. Or the church times are inconvenient, or we changed priorities. Many said they just can't find a church where they fit in. Well, if you're new to, here to New Life and you're wondering, is this a place where I fit in? It's a good day for you because I'm going to talk about the kind of church that I believe that God has called us to be. New Life is was started, it, it, we launched our first Sunday, actually in 1993. I'm not a math genius, I believe that's 30 years. And so for 30 years, we have watched as God has done immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine. Ephesians chapter 3, God promises that he is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine through his power that is at work within us. If you are new, I want you to know what God has done. I want to share with you some of the stories, some of the things that really matter so that we can move forward. If you are a new, if you've been coming to New Life for a while, you call New Life your home, I think it's important for all of us to be reminded from time to time so we can be united with Him. And I think that if we are united with God and His purposes and His priorities, I'm convinced that the next 30 years, people will see God do more than they could ask or imagine, more than we've seen in the first 30 years. That's my commitment to you. That's my desire for God. What kind of church is new life? I think it's important to begin with, understand the foundation is Jesus Christ. The church is built on, by, and for Jesus Christ. The church is built for the glory of Jesus Christ. On his foundation, 1 Corinthians 3, 11 says, no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid, and that foundation is Jesus Christ. Jesus made a really strong statement. If you want to know some of the core passages that I've leaned on for 30 years or more here at New Life, one of them is Matthew 16, 18, where Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Do you hear those three strong statements? Jesus says, it's my church. It's nobody else's church. It's not your church. It's not any small group of people's church. It's Jesus' church. And he builds the church. And when Jesus builds the church, he builds it with power. Even the gates of hell are not as powerful 
is the work of Jesus through his church. That is so important. I can't tell you the number of times. When New Life began, we were about 45 people every Sunday for the first three, four months. And I remember sitting, and about half of those were newcomers every week. And I remember sitting in the parking lot of Stone Middle School sometimes after a Sunday morning saying to my wife, Laura, if newcomers quit coming, we're toast. We're back to 25 people, I don't know. But there's a sense of which, you know what? We don't build the church. Our confidence is that, and, and Laura would tell you, although we had this sense of insecurity in ourselves, we knew that God hadn't called us to futility. We knew that God had called us to start the church, to build the church. He was gonna do it. A, a, a Psalm 127 verse one says, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor over it in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stay alert in vain. In vain you work on the, you get up early and stay up late, working hard to have enough food. On the other hand, when Jesus builds the church, he does more than we could ever ask or imagine. You look and you say, only God could do that. Look at the power, look at the answers to prayers. Look at the people that God's raised up. Look at the people that God sent out. And that's what our commitment is. Jesus, build the church. I'm not smart enough. We're not smart enough. You just show us how. And the question is, how does Jesus show us how he wants to build the church? That's why we say, or very clear, we are a Bible-based church. If you want to know why we teach what we teach, it's because we don't build the church. He builds the church. If you want to know why we make the decisions that we make, it's because we don't, make the, we don't build the church. He builds the church. Why do we build an end zone? It's not just because we want to have a building like this. It's because we looked and said, what are the biblical principles? If you're going to start a, a build a building, how would Jesus, what's consistent with the purpose of the church? What's consistent with good stewardship? And that's how you have something like the end zone. Jesus builds the church through the Bible. Second, Second Timothy chapter four, verse two. Paul writes, Preach the word. For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. They will turn away from hearing the truth and turn aside toward myths. I remember as a kid laughing at that passage, thinking, who would be so foolish as to want to listen to myths? You know, who would want, not want to listen to the truth, but instead like find teachers who will say what they want to hear. And then welcome to 2023 when there are a whole bunch of people who would say, oh, I don't think the church should teach that. Hey, if you teach that, people won't come to church anymore. Hey, people don't like church anymore because the church is da 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 It's like, okay, if you want the church to be built on you and on your wisdom, you can do that. Sometimes people are like, Brad, I appreciate your boldness. I don't have any boldness. I know if I don't preach the Bible, if we don't preach the Bible, teach the Bible, Jesus doesn't build the church. And we want Jesus to build the church for his glory, by his power. If you want to find a social organization, there are lots of churches out there if you want to find a church that makes you happy. You know? You want a ch church that tells you God wants you to be wealthy, you can find that church. You want to find a church that says there is Everybody goes to heaven. You can find a church that says everybody goes to heaven. In fact, my friend Tim Jones used to say churches like that at Christmas time, they don't sing Noel, Noel. They sing no hell, no hell. That's Tim Jones. That's bad, bad shit. Yeah. You can hear. Those of you who know Tim Jones can just kind of imagine Tim saying no hell, no hell. Anyway, you want to find a church like that? You can. You want to find, you want to find a church, legalistic church? There are some people that like that. Okay, you can find a legalistic church. But that's not Jesus' church. The church of Jesus is very careful to say, we're gonna preach the word. What we believe and what we do comes from scripture. We're gonna talk next week more about, I'm gonna do a devotion more on this, but we're gonna talk next week about the why. Why do we trust the Bible so much? But you know what practical that means for you? When you're looking for a church, there are a lot of things that motivate people to look for a church. I want a church where the worship is nice. I want a church where they have a really good children's ministry. I want a church that has a good youth ministry. I want a church that serves in the community. I want a church where I really like the people that go there. You know, I want a church that agrees with my politics. There are a whole bunch of reasons that really are wrong for people, prim not primary at least, for people to choose a church. You know the number one thing you need to ask? 
do they teach the Bible? Where do they stand on the Bible? There are some churches that believe the Bible changes us. There are some people believe we change the Bible. You need to find a church that says the Bible changes us. Jesus builds the church through his word. Second, the mission of Jesus, of, of new life is the mission of Jesus Christ. Life is, have you lived long enough to realize life is too short to waste? Just kind of drifting. That is why every organization that's a decent organization knows that it needs to have a clear, compelling mission. Etsy, for instance, their mission isn't to sell stuff. Etsy's stated mission is to keep human connection at the heart of commerce. Lego. Lego's mission is not, we build blocks for children to build with. Their mission is to inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow. Isn't that good? Dunkin' Donut. <laughs> I think Dunkin' Donut's mission is to make a buck while making you fat. <laughs> right? Their mission is, and um, it's easy to, take, to laugh at this one at first, we strive to keep you at your best with fried food, <laughs> fried dough. But anyway, we keep you at your best. And to remain, I like Dunkin', by the way. I'm a big fan of Dunkin' Donut coffee, especially. And to remain loyal to you, your tastes, and your time. That's what America runs on. I don't know what organizations you're part of. I know that some of you are part of organizations that you're part of them because you love the mission. You need to understand there is no mission more important or more compelling than the mission of Jesus Christ. It is the only eternal mission. And we make no apology for that. You know, sometimes people, I'm, okay, the church planter is coming out in me, but sometimes people are like afraid to ask people to volunteer. Oh, I don't want to burn them out. Oh, I don't it's like, what do you mean? You're afraid to take advantage of people. You have the chance to be a part of the kingdom of God, the work of Christ on this world. That's, that's a tremendous opportunity. Who would want to miss out on that? The mission of Jesus is really clear. He states it many places. It's one of the reasons you'll hear Matthew 28 around here a lot. Verse 19, Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. That's the mission of the church. Go, make disciples, all the world. And he continues. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. What's a disciple? Somebody who's baptized in Christ, somebody who's learning teaching them to obey, somebody who's obeying Christ. And I will be with you always to the end of the age. You know what it's all about? Here, this is the wonderful thing about the end of that. It's not just about you being a soldier who does what Jesus wants to do. It's about you walking with Jesus. He wants us part of his mission, not so he can use us, but so we can walk closely with him. That's the mission of the church when I think about that in new life terms, how God has kind of clarified it for us, I like to think about it in big picture, small picture. There's a big picture purpose of the church, but I wonder how many people actually understand how you and what you do every day is connected to the big picture mission of the church. Um, Madison uh, came up with a good picture for me to use that kind of illustrates the mission of the church. If you want to start, some of you are strategic planners, you like to start with the end in mind. If you start with the end, the far right, our purpose is to go and make disciples throughout the whole world. That's Jesus' call. Now, the way that we state it here is, new life makes disciples who make disciples that start churches that start churches, that make disciples that make disciples, so the whole world knows who Jesus is. Okay, the purpose of the church, we believe there's no more effective means of reaching lost people than starting new churches. That's why when New Life started, we said, we don't believe that God is starting one church. This is, the, if it's God's will and, and he blesses, this is the first of many that he's getting started because there's no more effective means of reaching a lost world than starting churches that make disciples that make disciples, reproducing disciples, reproducing churches. And so that's what we've done. Um, and so we, we, if you want to look at us individually, we have started some individual churches. And then we realized several years ago, this is, I remember Todd and I, Todd Wilson and I were sitting in our, uh, <laughs> what is now Gyra Cafe or something like that. It used to be our church office. And we were sitting up in our, in our and, and, and saying, you know what, if, if the world, if the church is going to have its 
redemptive impact to make disciples the key to church planting is not big mega churches planting, it's little churches who feel like they can never plant. How do you get those churches engaged? You need to start networks where churches, where like five churches can get together and work together to start a church and then that church is part of another church network, becomes part of another to start more churches, to start more churches. That's how you get everybody in the game. So that's what we have tried to do. We have not just started individual churches, but we start churches that then are networks. And you know how it's worked? How God, <laughs> um, we say we've started over 300 and some churches. Um, that, candidly, that really doesn't do God the honor that he deserves. We don't know how many churches that New Life has helped start. Um, because so many things, so many times that something like this has happened. Um, years ago, we helped Dave McCants start a church in North Carolina. Um, I was just, it's funny, I haven't been in touch with Dave for a while. We just have to talk a couple weeks ago. Um, Dave discipled somebody, raised up a fellow by the name of Roger Burns. God called Roger to plant a church. Roger, so we worked with Dave. Roger actually came through our Passion for Planting residency, church planter residency, used our Passion for Planting project management services. Um, it's pretty cool. You may not be aware of it, but there's, those of you who are project managers can't imagine actually doing something without a project management tool. There's no project management tool for church planting but the one that God gave us here when Todd Wilson was on, well, Todd is still on staff, but when we started church. So using that project management tool, um, Roger started church, and we started together as a network with him. Roger discipled Kevin McNeil. Kevin McNeil believed God was calling him to start a church. Kevin came through our, through our residency program, used our, church, our, 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 our coaching and our project management services, and then we worked together in a network to start Kevin's church. Kevin's preached here um, in the last couple of years. And then Kevin discipled, and he raised up a young man by the name of Corey, who I think it was last year or the year before, came through our residency program, um, used our tools. Now we've planted a church with her. He started a daughter church with Dave. With Dave, we started a granddaughter church led by Roger, with Roger, we started a great-granddaughter church with Kevin. With Kevin and Roger and Dave, we started a great-great-granddaughter church with Corey. And God builds the church. See, the key, do, you, do you understand some of the keys there to effectiveness? It's multiplication. It's reproduction all along the way. It's churches that reproduce, but if you really boil it down to its most basic level, it's individuals who are disciples making disciples who reproduce. That's why if you want to boil down, we say at New Life, well, we, our purpose is to start, to make disciples, make disciples, start churches, start churches. But if you really want to boil that down even more essentially, we go to John 10, 27. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. If the key is reproduction over here, it begins with reproduction with each person. One at a time, people making Jesus their good shepherd every day, hearing Jesus' voice and following. See, and individuals do that. How do we do that? We have to do that in the context of groups. You get growing disciples who are saying, Lord, what does it mean for us to go and make disciples? What are the, who are the people that you're wanting us to disciple? Who's going to disciple me? Who am I discipling other? You have growing groups of people making disciples who make disciples, groups that are increasing in number. That's how you get churches. You don't just have, you don't have, there's a sense in which churches plant churches, but really it's growing disciples plant growing churches that plant growing, reproducing churches. That's why, if you wonder why we push, you need to read the Bible every day. Why Tom makes 
uh, uh, Bible reading um, opportunities available every day, and we do videos all the time, you know, for weekly Bible studies. If you wonder why, we're always encouraging you, get connected, get in a small group. We're always encouraging you, how are you hearing God's voice and following? Who are you sharing your story with? It's because our individual obedience at this level is what is the key to reproduction around the world. What God's doing in you matters. Now, how do we live that out? What are the values that set our priorities? There are a lot of things that we value here at New Life. There are a lot of things that churches value. The question is, what is, distinguishes a church? What distinguishing values do we hold on to? I would share with you just four. First, joy, fun, happiness. Why? First of all, because we believe that God is a joyful God, a joy-giving God. There is joy, nowhere, no other source of joy than God himself. The world is all about joy. We want to be happy, right? But where do you find that? It is found at peace with God, in joy. When God creates the world, read the first two chapters of Genesis. It's clear. God creates the world for our joy. It's good. It's very good. Read the book of Revelation. Heaven is going to be a joyful place. C.S. Lewis said joy is the serious business of heaven. But have you noticed that Christians tend to do the serious part of God a lot better than they do the joy part of God? What's infectious is God's joy. But you're in right relationship with God. You're going to be joyful. Um, Psalm 1 says, blessed, happy. How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of of the wicked? or stand in the way of path. See, that's not what the world says. The world says you want to be happy, be wicked. You want to be happy, be free to sin. No, no, no. How happy is the one who doesn't walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway of sinners or sit in the company of mockers, but his delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates on it day and night. We believe joy reflects God's character points people to God's character and is a practical way to love people. I heard somebody say a couple of weeks ago, I hadn't thought about this, you know why we choose to be happy, happiness is the same reason we choose to brush our teeth. Not just for our own hygiene, but to bless other people. (laughs) Right? Don't brush your, try this experiment, don't brush your teeth tomorrow and go to work. Don't brush your teeth tomorrow and kiss your wife, right? What's going to happen? You're going to say, oh, you don't love me very much. Oh, please don't. There are a lot of Christians spiritually going around with, that, with spiritual mouths that have their teeth aren't brushed. They're not very happy. And so that's why we try to be joyful here on Sunday morning. I have to work. It's a discipline for me to put humor. I can be, I do serious really easily. It's the default. But we want to do joy. Okay, joy is one thing that's, that's just huge. And we believe that when When God is at work, there's great joy. All right, second is risk. This is huge. Um, It was funny, as God, some of the values that we have now, God revealed to us over time. Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, is one of those that God kind of revealed, this is the kind of church I want you to be. The parable of the talents tells the story, uh, Jesus tells the story of this man who goes on a mission, or a man who goes away. He's a wealthy man. He entrusts his wealth to three people to three men. One he gives five, to one he gives two, to one he gives one talent. And then he goes away. He comes back to give accountability to, for those, the way the talents were stewarded. The guy with five talents and two talents, they had doubled their talents. I always wondered what it was like. You know, if you're going to double your talents, you got to, anybody knows if you're going to double talents, you got to risk them. Um, I always have to wonder what it was like for them when they risked their talents before they knew they were going to double them, realizing if this goes south, we lose everything. They risked their talents. They double them. The master comes back, and what's he say? Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with little. I'll make you ruler over much. Enter into your master's happiness, your master's Joy, because God is a joyful God, a joy-giving God. Then he goes to the one talent fellow. And what did that guy do? He played it safe. He didn't risk. He lived by fear. He was driven by fear. He was afraid 
to lose. And so what he, did, he buried it. I love the fact, I mean, just notice, he didn't do something that was overtly sinful. He didn't go and waste it on booze. He didn't go and, you know, spend it at draft kings, you know, betting on some, whatever fantasy stuff. He just buried it, played it safe, lived in fear. And the master looks at him and he says, you wicked, lazy servant. You knew. You knew what I expected of you. You know the kind of person I am. And yet you played it safe. Now take that talent away from that lazy servant and give it to the, ten, the one who has ten talents because God is a respecter of stewardship, not just numbers. Give it to the ten talent guy and, and send that lazy servant into a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. We looked at that and we realized if we're going to be faithful to God, um, it means that sometimes you have to take risks in faith because you believe that they're consistent with God's purpose, what God wants you to do. You have to take risks in faith that are so great that if you lose, you lose everything. Again, we didn't learn this. I didn't learn this proactively. I learned it looking back. Two examples of that. Um, when New Life got started, we believed that God called us to be a church planting church. There's no more effective means of reaching lost people in this generation than starting new churches. And so, um, and so we wanted to start with somebody on staff who was going to be a church planter. That didn't happen, but God provided for us Vince Antonucci. By the way, how did God provide for us Vince Antonucci? One way is discipleship. Vince was in my discipleship group when I was an associate minister in Alexandria. Then he went away, decided to go into ministry, Wants, decides to go into church planting, decides God's calling him here to learn how to church plant, to go church plant. So Vince is with us for two years. And, um, and after two years, Vince is like, Brett, I think it's time for me to go plant. And I said, yeah, Vince, I, I hate to see you go, but I, you, I, that's why we brought you here to plant. Okay. And then he says, oh, and by the way, Joe Heilman wants to go too. Now you need to understand at that point two things. First of all, uh, New Life had three staff at that point, full-time staff, three full-time staff. Um, I was a senior minister, Vince was associate minister, and, um, and Joe was the worship leader. Vince, by the way, is going to speak here in a couple of weeks. Um, you are going to love Vince. In fact, I'm a little bit afraid because when you hear Vince, you're going to think, why didn't Brett go to Planet Church and we got to keep Vince, you know, kind of thing. Am I telling the truth, Bob? Yeah, Vince is, Vince is really funny. Anyway, but, um, but so, so, uh, so Vince is great. Um, Joe helped us start the church. He was with us from the very beginning, worship leader. The other thing you need to understand is that when, when Vince came, we were about 100 people. But when he left after two years, we were over 300 people. And, I, and now we're losing three, two-thirds of our staff. And I remember having a conversation with Marge Ferguson, Pat Ferguson's mom at that point. And I said to Marge, I said, Marge, um, I really don't know how a church of our size with our age, of our age overcomes losing two-thirds of the staff that are so talented as Vince and Joe. But I said, I also know there's, there's only one thing, you know, dumber than releasing them, and that is disobeying God. It is a much greater risk to disobey God when he says to risk than it is to release them. And so we sent them, and as much money as we possibly, more money than we actually could, and, and some people went down to help them get started, and that church is still going great. Um, Jason Bedell has preached here before. He's the senior minister there now. But I look back, that's one of those things like, oh, and, and by the way, a after that, God provided for us more staff, quality staff. Pat Ferguson came on staff. Todd Wilson came on staff. It was just like, and, um, and God provided. But I think we had to risk. I don't think that God would have honored if we hadn't risked for him. The other story that's profound for me um, is the first time that we as a church made our own budget. I, the first budget we made, I made with the church planting organization that started us. But then it came time 
for us, for our leadership to make a budget. In the room was Vince, I think Joe, I think Pat may have been there, and, um, uh, and Kevin O'Connor. Kevin O'Connor's a money guy. You know what money guys are like, right? Money guys are cautious. Money guys are careful. So we're looking at this budget, and the budget, the previous budget was $75,000. This new budget is going to be $125,000. I figured out the percentage of that. No, that's a lie. I can't figure out the percentage, but it's a big percentage, okay? That's a huge, and I looked at that, and I was kind of like, ah, I don't know how we, I'm not sure, how, I was thinking inside. I wasn't saying this. I was thinking inside. I don't know how smart this is. And Kevin O'Connor spoke up. I was really glad. Kevin's like, I have a concern for this budget. And I'm kind of like, I have a concern for this budget. I was thinking to myself, I have a concern for this budget. You know what Kevin said? Kevin looked at it, he says, my question is, where's the vision? Is there enough vision here to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish? And I tell you, that was an answer to Kevin O'Connor and in that moment, the word that the Lord gave him, that's the kind of church God has called us to be. Not a church that is afraid to lose or playing afraid to lose, but saying, God, what is your purpose? What is your mission? What is your vision? And help us to trust that you will provide if we are listening to your call, to your vision. And that's the kind of church that we've been since then. Um, I, I could tell you lots of stories about that. But So here's the question for you. Are you playing it safe or the risking? When was the last time you took a step of faith for God? If God wasn't in it, you fail. When was the last time you took a step of faith so risky for the glory of God that you were afraid you could lose it all? See, sometimes, part of the reason we planted a church is multi-site, back when there were fewer than 100 churches that were doing multi-site. Sometimes, if the church doesn't risk everything, to, part of the reason we have an end zone was because, okay, we had, do we do a safe thing or do we something, do something we've never seen done before? No, we believe that this is God's will. Sometimes, you've got to risk it all for the glory of God because he's calling you to that risk, not because of foolishness or avarice. When was the last time you took that kind of risk for his glory, for his purpose, on his mission? Next thing we, we um, value is honor. Romans chapter 13, verse seven, give honor to those you owe honor. We try to do things well because we wanna honor God and honor people. I talked to the staff about, are you creating wow? Don't just do events. Are you creating wow? So people go, wow, God's a great God. Wow. Look at God's power at work. Or are you just kind of doing it something like we've have done it before? Trying to recreate what you did last year. Um, Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2 says, Don't neglect to show hospitality, for by doing this, some have welcomed angels as guests without knowing it. What do you do? Is it honoring God? Is it honoring people? Is it creating a wow that make people say, wow, God's a great God? The final thing that I want to talk about that we value is next steps. Um, we always believe there's a next step. What's your, the, for, for the church, for everybody, what's your view of the church? You know the view of a lot of people have of church? It's a pond to get people in, right? We need to get more people in the church. No, the church is a river to move people on. There's a next step. God is a, is, is a God who wants us to draw closer to him and do more with him for his glory and experience his power new every morning. Think about, think about the trajectory of the church that Jesus started. Acts chapter one, verse eight. Jesus sends out his disciples and he says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Here are the next steps. Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the world. There's always a next step. I remember talking to one of my mentors when he started, when he went to his church, it was 250 people. When he retired, it was 18, over 18,000. And I said, Bob, I've, I've watched your church since I was in junior high. I remember when there were 400 and 500 and 600 and 1,000 and 2,000. I said, always up and to the right. What's the key to that? And first of all, he was humble enough to say, no, Brett, we haven't always grown. 
and you know, I, I know that they're, you know, it's God's power and I know all of that stuff, but in terms of your own obedience, what you could control, what do you think was the key? And he said, Brett, we never felt like we arrived. Whenever we got to a certain, whenever we took a certain hill, we never stopped and said, now we've arrived. We was always, what's the, God, what's the next hill you have for us to climb? There's always a next step for the church, for you, for your ministry. You know what brings momentum in church? When individuals are always taking next steps. When groups, when ministries are always taking next steps. When you're doing new things and, 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 and doing improved things. Again, look at the trajectory of the church. Remember the history of the church? How does it begin? The church begins with a man, Jesus Christ. And it quickly becomes a movement. Actually, for about, meant, for, for about three and a half years, it's Jesus and the 12. And then it becomes Jesus and 125. And then on the first day of the church, there's 3,000 baptized. And then a couple of chapters later, there's 5,000. And then, and then it, you know, it says the church, they add, the Lord added to their number daily. And then by the sixth chapter, and the Lord multiplied their numbers. They go from adding to multiplying. But what happens in the church, what happens in any organization, anybody who's organizationally minded knows this, eventually the organization becomes a machine. See, movement is increasing numbers of people. Once you get a large number of people, the larger number of people, you have to organize those people. And that's not all bad. You see organization in the sixth chapter of Acts and the church continues to grow. In fact, because of that organization, the church began to continue to grow. And so there is a machine dynamic, and so it's important to kind of stay in this sweet spot. But the nature of every organization is to become more and more about the machine. See, movement is about the mission. The machine is about the machine. It's about perpetuating the organization. Movement is about where do we need to go next? What's the next risk? You know what the machine is about? It's about fear. Machine people are asking, say things like, well, we can't do that because we don't have enough people. You know you're in machine mode whenever you say, I'm afraid of burning somebody out. Really? This is the kingdom of God. Most important thing somebody's gonna do. My experience is most people don't burn out for the kingdom of God. They burn out because they have other priorities that are lesser than the kingdom of God. And then church people apologize. Oh, we don't want people to burn out. There's fear. There's fear. We don't have enough people. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough. Rather than saying, God, if you have called us to it, you will provide. God, we will risk out of obedience to you because we want to do nothing less than be completely obedient to you. We want to be nothing less than the church that you have called us to be. And we will not settle because of our fear. And so, but churches do that. And that's what, you get to the fourth century and, and the church becomes a machine under Constantine. And it's about the organization. It's about per, self, you know, perpetuation. And it's about sin and, 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 the, and, and, and it just, it, in some ways, the, it begins like, um, and, and you know what happens if you become a machine long enough? You become a museum. You know, you, museums are places you go and say, man, those things from the past are really kind of cool. You look to the past all the time. So the key is, how do we follow the man to be his movement? What's your next step? That's why in New Life, we're always dreaming. Tim Mulcahy will tell you, we're always dreaming. You know, we, it probably never happened, some of this stuff, but we're always thinking, God, we haven't come to the end zone to say we've arrived. We're saying, how can we be the best stewards we can with this place? Lord, what's your next step? How do we develop this more? What more do you would have us to, you and your small group saying, what's our next step? How can we, hey, you, in your small group, you can say, hey, we have 10 people and we really like each other and we're really comfortable. Or you can say, how do we reach more people for Christ? How, there are more people that need the Lord. We've started about 10 to 12 churches a year the past few years. You know what we're working on now? And not just working, God's making it happen. How do you start 20 to 30 churches a year? How do you start 50 to 100 churches a year? And that's what this thing that we're working on called Renew Movement is about. And God does 
And when people obey, obey God and take his risks, God will do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine through his power that is at work within us. What does it mean for you to discover God? What does it mean for you to develop spiritually? What does it mean for you to deploy in service? What does it mean for you to share your faith so somebody else will take next steps as well? If the Middle East conflict reminds us of anything, it ought to remind us that people need the Lord. There will never be any peace until there's peace with Jesus Christ. Right, that's what the Bible says. Jesus is our peace. He is the one who tears down the dividing wall of hostility. I want that hostility to end, but it's not gonna come because of people. It's gonna become people find peace with God and then peace with each other. That's your mission. Has our mission ever been more clear or more important than in this generation? Somebody once observed that the Gulf Stream will pass through a straw provided that the straw is aligned with the Gulf Stream and not at cross purposes with the Gulf Stream. God is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask for or imagine through his power that is at work within us as long as we are aligned with him. Again, it's not my church. It's not your church. It's not we get to do what we want to do. It's it's by his glory and for his glory. There's room for glory in this world for nobody but Jesus. And by his, for his glory, by his power, he makes it happen. And isn't that good news? Because we can't build a church. We're not smart enough. We're not powerful enough, but he is. And I would just invite you, let's build the church together with Jesus. Let's pray together, please. Lord, we, after 30 years, we just want to renew our commitment to you. We want to say thank you to you for what you have done. And we want to look to the past and appreciate what you've done. We want to look to the future and see what you might do, but mostly we want to look to you and just say, Lord, um, we need you. We need you to lead us. We need you to give us wisdom. We need you to empower us. Um, Lord, this world's a mess that we're living in, and we're, we can't do it, make a difference unless you are doing the work through us. And so this is our prayer for your glory, that more people will say, God is a great God. Through Christ, I pray these things. Amen.